Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Heart to Heart Roundtable Talk. So, well, it's still me alone by myself talking, and hopefully, you will have some guests coming on the show soon because there's more fun when there's more people. But um, I'm a little bit late today because I'm still trying to get this whole routine down. Taking a few more weeks, I'll have everything all down and we'll go live on time. But anyway, so I'm going live right now on Instagram, on my Instagram, Anna the Dietitian, and also on my Facebook page. Um, I think it's Anna Thai Wellness. But anyway, um, yeah. So today is our third episode, and I just want to talk about something that I think. Everyone needs to know because these are advice that a lot of my patients are following, and obviously it is not working. And I think it's just a good thing to talk about. So basically, is um the title of the talk today is bullshit advice, bullshit nutrition advice that's hurting you, especially hurting your relationship with food and your metabolism, your health, and also. And also your self esteem and confidence. So okay, so let's get started. So um, I hope I have the time for five of them because I I have a list over here with all five of them listed. I just write that because sometimes I forget when I'm just blah 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 blah. Okay, so the first one is calorie deficit um, for weight loss. So probably some of you have read my posts and things like that. I talk a lot about how calorie deficit doesn't work, but let me clarify something very beginning. So you might be like, "Oh my gosh, she, what the hell she's talking about? Like, what do you mean calorie deficit doesn't work? Calorie deficit doesn't work in the long run. For sure, if you starve yourself enough, you're gonna lose weight. Just look at the World War Two concentration camp survivors or the pictures." From the World War Two, calorie deficit will work in in some ways to lose that weight, but it's not going to be a long term solution. And I'm going to explain more about that. So, with calorie deficit, what happened is so the the nutrition advice that all dietitian and even myself used to give up because that's what we're taught in school is so for every pound of body fat, it's about three three thousand five hundred calories. So if you deduct five hundred calories a day from your diet, you're gonna lose one pound of body fat a day. That's like sounds really good in theory, right? But um, but does it really happen? Not really. And um, especially over the few years. And the reason why I I'm speaking, like talking about all this advice and things like that, um, is not because it's all bullshit that I make up. It's like I see this in my patient every single day. And that's why I want to do this here, and as a what you call that, like a public service advice or、um, something like that, to help people live a better life. It just it just annoys me every day seeing women coming to see me trying to lose weight and following all this bullshit advice and not losing the weight. It's just very heartbreaking. So yeah, so Kelly does this. It doesn't doesn't work, and this is how it works. So, when you cut that five hundred calories a day, your metabolism goes down five hundred calories. So that's how it works. That that nutrition advice that says, "Oh yeah, calorie deficit. You cut five hundred calories a day, you're gonna lose one pound of body fat a day." It doesn't doesn't take into consideration that your body is a very smart survival machine. When you cut that five hundred calories a day. Its metabolism drops five hundred calories, and for most people, they're like, "Oh my God, five hundred calories a day that I drop is still not losing weight. Let me cut more." So then you cut another five hundred calories by exercising more. Then your body's like, "Oh, less calories coming in. I need to bump down the calories more." And then you know what happened, right? Like after you go on a diet, you were restricting yourself, exercising a lot. Then you're like, "Oh, I get down to a weight that I want." So. Let's go back to our eating how I used to eat. So then you go back up to say two thousand calories was what you normally eat. So you went back, start eating how you used to eat two thousand calories a day.
but your metabolism has been adjusted to a thousand calories a day because remember you've tried to cut out 500 calories and then another 500 calories so your metabolism went from a 2000 calories spending a day to a thousand calories a day so you see that gaps right now right so this is the gap that extra calories now that you're having and that's how people start whenever they go on like dieting they restrict themselves to lose the weight and then they go back to the old eating, then they gain all the way back, plus that extra more. And this is the extra more because you try to restrict your calories intake. So that's one way how this calorie deficit advice messed up your metabolism. The second thing is that um, I want to talk about is there is studies to support this and no one talks about it because they only talk about this in people with eating disorder. But um, I'm going to talk about it here so everyone can be advised and start living a better um, health, better life, and be more confident. Okay, so this is actually, um, it's called the Minnesota Starvation Study. It is a study that is published around the time in World War II. And the reason why this study was um, actually initiated is because during the World War II, a lot of people didn't have food and there's a lot of starvation and they start noticing that with people who've been starving you can't really like just feed them like like give them regular meal so they want to study how the effects of starvation on the human body and what's the most effective way to treat someone who have experienced extreme starvation so disclaimer here this um study will not and will not ever be duplicated again in today's world because the study is actually inhumane so it will not be allowed to duplicate again but anyway so this study unfortunately the study is done on man but um the idea is still still the same so they take i think 28 or 30 my numbers are fuzzy here but they take a bunch of healthy men who like in the beginning of the study, give them a 3,000 calories diet and they just work out like how they normally would. So that's the control part. And then after the control period, they put them on a restricted diet. So this is actually not a full on starvation. It's only 50% starvation. So they go from 3,000 calories a day to 1,500 calories a day. So only 50% decrease in the, the calories intake. But what they found is after that starvation period, a lot of this men, actually most of them, develop eating disorder behavior. People that are hoarding food. So they were, the normal calories intake was 3,000 calories a day. So they found that some of these people or these men actually, when there's food, they were hoarding food. They're eating up to 7,000 to 10,000 10, calories a day on some days. They were hiding food. They're constantly thinking about food and obsessed with food. So that's the take on the study. On this study is that when you restrict your calories intake, it actually changes your behavior around food. And that's part of the human, um, what you call that? The, the hum, human, what you call Human instinct. Because our body is, an, is a survival machine. So anytime you put your body at risk of dying, starving, it is going to undo all that. So, um, and that's the reason why some of you who are dealing with binge eating, a lot of times all you need to do that stop, that to stop the binge eating is really to not restrict your, um, your eating and let your body know that, hey, food is always available. You don't need to hoard everything in your body. So that's the calorie deficit. And then what's the next thing I'm going to talk about? Oh, so the next thing is breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And that's bullshit because every meal is important. But what they're also encouraging is that you need to eat breakfast every day. And people often think that they don't eat breakfast. So let me change your thinking here. So a lot of my patients, like, Usually during um, my assessment, I ask them, oh, so what do you usually, how many meals do you eat? What do you eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And they usually give me this look, like this guilty and shameful look, like, oh, I, I usually skip breakfast because I'm not hungry. And I'm like, 
um, no, 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 no. You cannot skip breakfast, and this is the reason why. So breakfast is actually two words. It's breakfast. So you're actually breaking the overnight fast, and breakfast is the first meal of the day. So unless you're like, like really starving and not eating, there's no way you're gonna skip breakfast because it is the first meal of the day. And unlike everyone trying to tell you you need to eat right after waking up, you don't need to eat breakfast right after eat, right after waking up. Because if you're waking up and you're not hungry yet, it's your body's telling you that you're not hungry and I'm good. You can wait a little bit. You eat until you're ready, and when your body's ready, it will send you a signal that it is I'm hungry and go get food. So part of the part of the problem with like people giving advice like oh you actually not people giving advice it's like food manufacturer who wants to sell you all those junk breakfast cereal and stuff telling you that oh yeah breakfast is important eat eat this cereal pour pour all this like like sugary cereal in your bowl and drink it do it with milk and stuff so it is more of a for profit advice, it's not really a health advice, so you have to be careful where you get this nutrition advice from. But anyway, you cannot skip breakfast because breakfast is the first meal of the day. So like, even if you wake up like eight o'clock and I have your breakfast at ten o'clock, like me, I just started have my smoothie now and I woke up like eight o'clock this morning. But you just need to learn to listen to your body instead of listening to someone who don't know you. Someone, something that you read on a magazine or someone, like on social media, talking about what time you're supposed to eat. Like you're the one who knows what time you should be eating. You are the guru of your own life and own health. So take control of that. Okay. Next. Uh. Oh, so speaking of breakfast, so a lot of people skip breakfast thinking that they're doing the intermittent fasting. Okay, the truth about intermittent fasting. Like this, this is the thing that everyone talks about intermittent fasting now. Like all my patients come say, oh, I'm, I'm doing like intermittent fasting. I'm doing the 18-6. I'm doing this and that. I was like, okay, that sounds really good. So the problem with the intermittent fasting is Again, how, how it hurts your relationship with food is you are depending on an external um, trigger to tell you when to eat. So you're looking at the time on the clock to tell you when to eat. Again, if you want to have permanent health and, and lasting weight loss and, and like wonderful relationship with food, you have to learn how to listen to your body and, and um, meet your body needs when it needs it. So with intermittent fasting, you're depending on a clock to tell you when to eat. And like, it just came out of my mouth and I think that, that sounds really silly because the clock is telling me when to eat. No, you don't. You tell yourself when to eat. Actually, your body is very brilliant. It'll tell you when to eat. That's why we have the signs of hunger. And I don't know for some of you, who haven't have like normal appetite for a while, you might not be able to distinguish your hunger or your fullness, but it is something that you can learn again. And we'll talk about that in the future. Um, but anyway, so intermittent fasting. So the only issue I have with intermittent fasting is the fact that you have to look at the time to tell yourself when to eat. But the truth is that every human being has been practicing intermittent fasting all of this time except for babies newborn babies eat every two or three hours they don't care it's three o'clock in the morning i want food now and i want it now and you're gonna wake up and feed me but other than that every human has been practicing intermittent fasting all of this time hi michelle um so you need to understand that it is not something fancy that some scientists invented. It's just that how human has been doing since the beginning of time. Just imagine before electricity. Before there is electricity, what do we do? We wake up when the sun comes up, so there's light, and it rises our cortisol level, and we wake up, open our eyes, and we, we just do as much things as possible during daytime when there's light. And then when there's no light, 
everything is dark, you can't do much of anything. So then you just go sleep. So, so when you go sleep, from the time you go sleep at sundown, and then until you wake up the next morning, sun up, that's your intermittent fasting because you you don't have anything to do. You just go sleep. You don't wake up and go to a fridge and look for food. You don't go go wake up in the middle of night, drive down to Jack in a Box to get food. You just go to sleep, and that's your fasting, and that's the intermittent fasting. So if you want to have lasting relationship with food and wonderful metabolism, the way to do it is to listen to your body and not listen to the clock on the wall because that clock does not know you, and that clock is not part of you. Okay, So that's intermittent fasting. And then the next item on my on my list oh wait actually go back a little bit on the intermittent fasting the reason why intermittent fasting work is because is because intermittent intermittent fasting the whole idea of the intermittent fasting is that time between this meal and the next meal this whole stretch of time that you're not eating your insulin level goes down so the idea is to keep that insulin level down and like I said, you do that when you go to sleep anyway. You don't really have to starve yourself for 18 hours. You can just do it like in the morning, like have your last meal, your dinner. And then if you're hungry at, at that time, just eat something small, go up. So every day you're practicing intermittent fasting as long as you're not waking up in the middle of the night raiding the kitchen. You are practicing intermittent fasting. And like I said, the reason why intermittent fasting works is because of the low insulin level during that, that period of time. And it is also the same reason why none of us die in our sleep, except a few of my patients who actually could die in their sleep um, because of some rare disorder. But most people, most normal people do not die during sleep. It's because when we go to sleep and the insulin level comes down because we're not eating, then what our body does is it start burning fat for calories and energy. Even though when we're sleeping, our caloric needs is actually very low, but we're still using energy because at nighttime when we're sleeping, we're actually, we still have a lot of body function going on, like body repairing, heart pumping, breathing, and all these other hormonal things going on. So there is still a caloric need during the night but we're using more body fats at nighttime, at um, overnight, during that overnight fast. So, and the idea is that at night we're being using more like fats because carbs is usually not available, like not readily available. Um, and and one way to trick the trick do the fasting is just to not eat carbs, and that's what the ketogenic diet is. But I'm not going to do dig into all of that detailed stuff. I can do it in another post with all the biochemistry, chemistry, and all those things all included. But um, what's the next one? So speaking of the carbs and insulin, so next one is um, carbohydrates. So there's like a lot of people talking about how carbs are bad for you. Carbs are really not bad for you. You need to understand that there's good carbs and bad carbs. So Let's talk about the bad guys first. So the bad carbs are the ones that raise your blood sugar, so give you that sugar spike, and then the sugar crash. And we call that the, the blood sugar roller coaster. So these are the carbs that whoop, bring your blood sugar super high, and then, then your body corrects, overcorrects that with a huge load of insulin. So you get the sugar crash. And when your sugar crash or your sugar gets too low, that's when you have sugar cravings. And when you have the sugar cravings, so you now load yourself up with a lot of sugar and carbs again. So you get the sugar spike again, then your body reacts again with a lot of insulin, then you get the, the, the crash again. So all day long, you're just going up and down, up and down with your blood sugar. And the problem with that is that all that up and down in the blood sugar is going to mess up, first of all, mess up your metabolism and your hormones because your insulin is now out of whack because like, oh my God, are we up or are we down? And unlike the blood sugar that goes up and down like that, your insulin actually stays up for a longer period of time. So that's how people can develop insulin resistance 
and then pre-diabetes and PCOS and um, sometimes hypothyroidism can be linked to part of that as well. So that's how how like when you how sugar affects us. So that's the bad sugar we're talking about. But we want to have good carbs because good carbs are the ones that provide you with energy level. It gives you energy, it boosts your metabolism, it improves your digestion. So those are the carbs that we want. So what's the good carbs and bad carbs? So good carbs are the ones that pretty much all your fruits and vegetables, even your starchy vegetables and the fruits that have sugar, they're all considered your good carbs because even though they have carbs in it, the carbs from your fruits, vegetables, and beans, these carbs actually turn, convert into blood sugar in a much slower pace. So that's why like you can eat like, like I have patients easily eat a whole bag of like family size chips in one sitting, right? And that's one pound, one pound of chips. But then they'll have a hard time eating a pound of carrots. So that's the difference because carrots have like all your healthier carbs have like water and fiber in it. So those things actually slows you down. It suppresses appetite because the fiber in it actually triggers um, the stretch receptor in the stomach to tell your body that, hey, there's enough food in here. You can stop eating. But on the other hand, if you eat a bag of chips or cookies, there's no fiber in it. There's all pure sugar and pure calories. So you just keep eating and eating and you don't know when, when it's full because there's nothing to tell you that it is full. And besides the nutritional value difference between like, like real food, eating fruits and vegetables compared to a bag of chips or cookies or candies, the nutritional value just couldn't compete with um, compare because there's no nutritional value in all this junk food. So your body's thinking, oh, she's eating. She's eating a lot of food, but I'm still not getting the nutrients that I need. And the nutrients that your body needs is like the macronutrients, like carbohydrate, protein, and fats. Those are your macronutrients, but your body also needs micronutrients, things like vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. So that's how, how one way sometimes people like feel like they're eating and eating, but they're still always hungry. It's because your body's like, something's still missing. You need to keep going, eat and eat. But because you're not understanding that what your body needs, so you keep feeding your body a wrong kind of food. It's kind of like your car. You just have to make sure that you put the right kind of fuel in your car if you want your car to go like a certain distance and take you to places. So that's good carbs. Oh, so what, what's the bad carbs? Bad carbs will be what well, I kind of mentioned a few, like chips, cookies, crackers, candies. I call the C words because they all start with the C. So let, let's see. Cereal, cookies, chips, crackers, cakes. Um, but I'll start with the C. Maybe that's all I have. If you think of any, just type in the comment and let me know. And then um, any kind of dessert, sweets, um, pies. So pretty much all the things that spike blood sugar. So you want to avoid this. But then again, I'll talk about that in the next one. But um, these are the food that you need to understand is going to spike blood sugar, cause inflammation, and then cause insulin resistance. So those are the really, really good reason to avoid it. Okay, and then the next item I'm going to talk about is, oh, you got to love this. Because it's, we keep telling everyone, like even as dietitian, we tell everyone all the time, you are what you eat, and that's bullshit. <laughs> And well, there's some truth to that. Like the food that I eat turns into a tissue on my body. But the problem with that is when we keep saying that you are what you eat, it changes our thinking. And that's, I think, is a problem with a lot of people who have poor relationship with food and suffer from binge eating and things like that because they, they gauge the self-worth on the type of food that they eat. So say they're, they're trying to eat healthy and try to lose weight. And then one day someone gives them, asks them for cookies or cake and they ate that. And then they're like, oh my God, I'm such a bad person. I just have a cookie and I have a piece of cake and I'm not supposed to have that. So that, that makes, 
I guess in a sense that it creates that false false sense of who you are because you are not what you eat. You are just who you are, whoever you're born with, or whatever, or how you, or the way you're born. That's who you are. You're not determined by the food you eat. You're not determined by by the car you drive, the clothes that you wear, or the um, or who you go out with, who you hang out with. You're none of those. So don't let food determines who you are. And or definitely not the number on the scale. And your dress size, or how you look, but um, yeah, you you need to understand that you are just who you are, and you're just perfect the way you are. No one's gonna determine if you're a good person, bad person. Like they don't count. Anyone outside you don't count. The number on the on the scale doesn't count. Seriously, you're not gonna let a twenty dollar scale tell you who you are. It just does sounds ridiculous, and if you remember the story of Snow White, remember the Evil Queen. She has the magic mirror that she talks to every day, and she asks every day, "Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the, who's the fairest of them all?" Like, that is so stupid. Like, you don't let the scale or mirror tells you who you are. You just perfect, just the way you are. Remember, we're all born with perfect confidence when we're a little baby. We never question our demand. We eat and poop whenever we need to, and parents do it for us, just perfectly fine. And when we say "make a sound," they're like, "Oh my gosh, she's make a sound!" Or when we smile, our parents so excited, "Oh my gosh, she smiled! Look at that!" Like. That's how we're born with, and you're going to live that and relearn all of that again. Don't let anyone, anything, especially something that doesn't even have a brain, tells you who you are. Okay, so that's all all the things I have today. And then, if you have any like special topics you want me to talk about, or like burning question, put that in the comment, or you can message me if you're on. Instagram, you can message me. If you're on Facebook, either on my Facebook page or Facebook group, you can shoot me in、um, a message, or like I said, put it in the comment. But anyway, I'll see you guys next Saturday. Oh no, next next Sunday. All right, and you guys have a wonderful weekend. Okay, bye.